Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris and Moby, for having me. In 1998, I founded a blockchain company. Although we were not market savvy enough to call it blockchain, we called it multi-party crypto computation. And when we founded the company, it was focused on online elections that would maintain the secret ballot, but also create open, auditable, uh, and uh, secure elections. And when we started the company in 1998, the market was ice cold. Two things happened that changed that radically. The first was that in November, on November 10th, 2000, we closed $10.8 million of venture capital, which is pretty amazing because that was right during the dot-com meltdown that started in March of that year. And the second thing that happened was three days before our closing, the country went to vote in election 2000 uh, for either George Bush or Al Gore. And for those that are old enough to remember that election, it was marked by dimpled, pregnant, and hanging chads, and uh, an incredible Supreme Court case uh, that ended in a five to four vote to stop the recount, and Bush ended up winning Florida by 537 votes to become our 43rd president. Uh, back at our startup, things went from ice cold to white hot in a matter of weeks. And we were vigilantly productizing our protocols. Uh, secret ballot elections that were auditable were uh, difficult. Uh, in an election run by partisans, the inmates are running the asylum. So you want to make sure no one can cheat without being detected. And this is what our crypto protocols really allowed us to do. And so we were really excited. We thought this was going to go great. We were using homomorphic encryption and mixed nets uh, to support write-ins and efficiency. And uh, we had a great uh, crypto, crypto team. Uh, my job was to keep the company funded, uh, build trust in our protocols, uh, productize the technology, uh, grow sales and marketing, and you know all this important stuff that a startup does. And we were pretty successful for a while. Uh, we had leading cryptographers approve our protocols. Uh, we had done elections for 15 million voters around the world. We ran uh, our uh, annualized revenue run rate uh, was about 15 or millions of dollars at the time. But then something weird happened. Uh, the federal government put $4 billion uh, into elections, and we experienced uh, our own kind of inflated bubble. Uh, about five times the amount of money that traditionally went into voting went into voting. And we thought that would be great, but it really didn't turn out to be all that great. Uh, Things, as I said, went to white hot, and what happened was things became very political, very partisan. Uh, reminds me a little bit about uh, like the environment we're in now. Uh, and it was uh, incredibly difficult to move the market. And so this was my first experience with a hype cycle, where a ton of money comes in, a ton of players come into the space. Uh, there's not, there's more heat than light, and it's a challenge, an unexpected challenge, sort of a high-class problem of an embarrassment of riches where not a lot gets done. Uh, and I think in the blockchain world, you all are experiencing your own hype cycle. Uh, this is pitch books, number of deals, and amount invested uh, over the last uh, 10 or so years. and. Uh, we're going to probably see about a third the investment as, as the uh, uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, field saw uh, from last year. So since the 2000s, I've been sort of enamored with hype cycles. I see them everywhere. And for those that I'm sure most know what a hype cycle is, it's this uh, the cycle that repeats over and over in tech, the technology world, where a technology gets introduced, there's incredible expectations that, uh, that follow this new technology. 
Uh, it's going to do everything for everyone. It's a dessert topping. It's a floor wax. It will do. It, it's it's perfection. And with that comes a ton of resources, a lot of venture capital, a, a bunch of talent, and it fuels these expectations. Bunch of press and. Then what happens, the technology doesn't really pan out, doesn't really meet expectations. Uh, maybe the adoption is not as fast as we thought. And then there's the, the opposite over rotation, where uh, now the technology will do nothing for anyone. And it's terrible. And uh, everyone should just run far away from this technology because it's kryptonite, it's poison. And, Gardner calls this the trough of disillusionment, and that's where it stays until it sort of claws its way out and proves out some productivity through what Gardner calls a slope of enlightenment uh, to actually produce something that's valuable uh, to society. So I saw this hype cycle, and I said, wow, given the, my engineering background, uh, as Bhaskar said, I used my, started my career launching rockets for what's now Lockheed Martin, and so I was a control systems engineer, and this hype cycle looks a lot like uh, an engineer's transient response, where uh, if you don't know what a transient response is, uh, you're surrounded by them. Uh, when you set your uh, temperature on your thermostat, the temperature sort of follows this curve. When you set your speed on your automatic cruise control, uh, the speed kind of follows this curve, and so, this is uh, something you're surrounded with. It's always sort of the position and time and then some target you're trying to hit. And so I thought, wow, this sort of this hype cycle thing uh, that Gartner's putting out looks a lot like what I've I spent a good chunk of my early career doing. And so if you sort of think about it in that context, if the y-axis then instead of position is market activity, which is similar to Gartner's expectations on the y-axis, and then x-axis is time, but the target is actually productivity, or in the VC world, we like to say product market fit. You end up with this sort of overshooting and then sort of ideally a settling in to a product market fit, successful company, customers buying your product, and uh, value to society. So, but what's interesting is these transient uh, curves have more than one mode. They actually have four modes. And it's kind of instructive, actually. So the first mode uh, that I want to talk about is this runaway. So if you look at the first curve at the top, it sort of never bends over and tracks the target. This is analogous to, say, you set your cruise control at, uh, in your car for a certain speed, and it just accelerates right off the road. Uh, not an attractive product feature. Uh, the other side of it is the overdamped case where it's this slow, plodding march toward the target, and uh, it's very slow. Uh, the perfect case is called critically damped, and it's the fastest response with no overshoot. And then there's the underdamped case, which tends to overshoot. It's very fast on the uh, uh, through the target, but then it overshoots it, and it comes back down and, and hits it. So those are the four flavors. Now think about it in a business context. Uh, the runaway is a, fia a business fiasco, right? You just pour a bunch of money in, and the company never hits product market fit. Uh, we don't know whether the money was wasted due to incompetence or fraud. We just know the money's gone, and that's not a company you really want to invest in. Uh, the other side of it, the overdam cases, is really the mom and pop uh, lifestyle company. It might be profitable, uh, but it might not, may not be profitable only in one market. It may not scale, and it never really gets to product market fit, and it's certainly not attractive for venture capitalists who like to see 3 to 5x our investment in five years. Uh, the third case is the critically damped is, is what I call the fantasy case. This is when typically a new uh, entrepreneur comes in and says they have the perfect solution, uh, to the perfect uh, huge market, and they, don't, they only need one round of funding because they're going to make revenues and profits, and it'll be great. We pass on those deals. What the reality is is that there is this overshooting that you don't even know where the target is. You don't know what the customers ultimately want, and so you need to pivot around. And, uh, 
And so the reality case is you overshoot and you come back down just like Gardner's hype cycle. Uh, Mike Tyson has a great quote about, about this. He says, uh, no fight plan ever survives the first punch in the mouth. And no business plan ever survives the first contact with the customer. And so most companies never experience that fantasy curve of perfection. They always overshoot. They pivot around. They come and they find the productivity that their investors and the founders and the executive team and, and employees hope to, to achieve. So that's the micro. Now let's, here's another hype cycle. Uh, presented by Ray Dalio. I don't know if folks know Ray Dalio. He runs uh, Bridgewater Associates, the largest hedge fund in the world at 160 billion under management. And Ray has this uh, great video called uh, How the Economic Machine Works. Uh, go watch the video. I suggested it to my 20-something boys and they ridiculed me mercilessly for making them watch high school type explainer videos, but it's awesome. And it really does make this case that if you look over a century, this is the kind of economic behavior we see. Uh, we see three phenomena. The first one is a march of productivity, uh, this ramp of productivity. And then we see these little squiggly lines which is the business cycle, both expansion and recession, that is about, has a period about five to seven years. And then we have this leveraging slowly over time that ends in this, usually these horrific deleveragings, uh, as evidenced by the 2010 recession, Great Recession, and the 1930s Depression. So this is really all you need to know about the uh, economy. Uh, Dahlia makes the really, I think, subtle but so important point that without debt, you'd have no squiggles. Debt is what, and capital availability, makes the squiggles. If you didn't have any squiggles, everybody would have to do everything on layaway. They'd have to just uh, uh, invest uh, their own money in this productivity and there'd really be no business cycles. So for our purposes, let's get rid of the big, uh, the big sine wave because we only care about fundamentally the, the, the shorter term. And so if you get rid of the big sine wave, you're left with the little squiggles. Uh, again, growth versus time. Uh, we rotated, uh, uh, well, we, we have uh, Dalio's productivity curve uh, ramp. And you can see that uh, debt fuels these cycles. So uh, if you're going to invest, you're going to expect a return. Well, venture capital is a form of debt. It's a form of capital availability. And uh, if there's too much capital chasing ideas that aren't so good, uh, you end up having bigger amplitude on these sine waves. And, and kind of bad things happen. And bad things are starting to happen. A uh, couple points here. Uh, if you look at... Uh, the global economic output or uh, contribution from startups is about 0.4% right now. And I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but right before the dot-com bust of 2000, global economic contributed by startups was 0.6%. So we're about two-thirds of where we were right before the dot-com crash. 10% of the revenue from the big tech companies are coming from startups. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> and, and if you look at the public markets, the recent IPOs have really suffered. Uh, the most visible example was WeWork delaying or cutting their IPO by 75%, the value of their IPO by 75%, and then pulling it all together. So we are, in my opinion, just my opinion, uh, we are at the height of, uh, of this cycle. Uh, I think some of us are, have fallen down the other side of it. I think blockchain has fallen down the other side of it. <laughs> Uh, and is in the trough of disillusionment. Uh, and that's not a bad thing, because there's been tremendous resources drawn into uh, the industry, and it has to go through this uh, curve in order to actually create real value. So I think uh, we all should be uh, somewhat fortified by the, the, the idea that we're, we, we faced uh, uh, sort of the, the worst of it, uh, in some sense. And we see the same thing in autonomy, autonomous cars. Autonomous cars had a big hype uh, a couple years ago, and uh, we're seeing a lot of consolidation for self-driving cars now. 
Uh, so that's the macro side. Let's go back to the micro. Uh, so if you just take one of these cycles, uh, pick your industry. I, I would argue you can even use one of these curves for a startup. Uh, and this is just like our hype cycle, but rotated uh, onto Dalio's productivity curve. You see that, again, uh, gets introduced, overshoots the, uh, the product market fit, and then settles back in. The availability of a lot of market uh, capital uh, into a market is really quite, uh, it's good for a little while, but as soon as it gets out of balance, it could be really perniciously destructive. And what do I mean by that? Uh, Dalio says uh, that one person's income is another person's spending. So if I'm getting the income, I don't really care where the spending comes from. I don't care if it's debt or, I don't, uh, or, debt or earnings or money made from selling to customers. And so what happens when venture capital, there's too much venture capital, yeah, prices go up, rounds get really big, and the employees get... Um, Spoiled is the wrong word. Uh, I think entitled, <laughs> perhaps. But more importantly, they don't, they don't stay hungry enough to understand how to sell real value to real customers. They actually confuse the money that comes from promises to investors with money from satisfying customers. And I think that's really difficult. Like, So you're in a startup, and the executives usually get this, but you walk in some of these companies, and the facilities are lavish. And the food is free. And massages are every day. <laughs> and they're not selling anything. They're not selling a thing. They're selling stock to investors. So the company gets really good at selling stock to investors instead of selling product to customers. Why? Because there's just a glut of money. And it just it's, it's doesn't really help. Uh, the startup, for sure, doesn't sell them, help the market, uh, and it really hurts long term if it goes on for too long. So what do we do at Toy AI Ventures to deal with that? We focus on the ramp. We focus on the product productivity ramp. We look for companies that ultimately uh, will create real value for real customers uh, and ultimately provide some productivity gains to society. That's the only thing. It's the only way we can stay grounded. If we just keep chasing the, the last hype, we're always going to buy at peak hype. And if you buy at peak hype, you will lose money. So Toyota AI Ventures, we're trying to figure out what's next for Toyota. Uh, we have a very long range horizon. Uh, we know that startups are very fragile, especially early on. So we are very founder friendly. We look like an institutional financial venture capital fund. We're separate. Uh, entity in Toyota. We're a separate company. And yeah, Toyota has global reach and amazing expertise. But if we are not good corporate investors, we can hurt these startups. So uh, tear sheet on the, on the fund. We have 200 million under, under management. Uh, we are, we've done 27 deals since July 2017. So we're pretty active. We do early stage uh, investments in AI, data, cloud, autonomy, mobility, and robotics. Uh, we're built for speed. Uh, we have a small board. Uh, for an automotive company, that's surprising. Uh, for a Japanese automotive company, it's uh, amazing. Uh, and I think what's important is, if you look at our fund goals, it's strategic return and financial return. And I would argue that financial return actually precedes strategic return. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if we are focused on companies that will make money, two things happen. One is we, we're aligned with the founding team and the co-investors. We want what they want. And two, it's going to help Toyota ultimately partner with strong companies. If we did it the other way and we just said, well, we want strategic companies that are strategically aligned with Toyota, we don't care about their financials. We don't care about how good a strong company they'd be. We have a bunch of losing companies that are strategically aligned with Toyota. What good is that? Uh, it's no good. And so we, are, we really are focused on, on financials. And I'm going to uh, talk about a, a little bit more detail on that uh, in a second. But on the portfolio, uh, like I said, there's technologies, 
And these are across a bunch of different uh, modalities, operating systems and uh, fast chips. And we actually invested in, in a company called Moodify, which is doing functional fragrances uh, to help, say, uh, uh, block certain smells uh, like stale cigarette smoke or body odor uh, if you get into a ride-hailing car, uh, or ultimately wake you up if you fall asleep at the wheel, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and then we look at applications, like uh, robots in the home and enterprise. So we're, we're Toyota, but we're not just focused on cars. We're looking out over the horizon. Uh, Toyota may not make cars forever. Actually, many people don't know, I know some do in the room, that Toyota started out as a loom industrial machine company uh, and then pivoted to cars. That pivot worked out pretty well. Uh, and we don't know what Toyota may pivot to next. And so we're looking at, of course, road uh, applications, uh, moving people, moving uh, 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 packages, uh, autonomy technologies. We just had an exit in Blackmore LiDAR company to Aurora. We're very excited about that. Uh, and then on the bike lane and the sidewalk, if you look at the real estate that we're looking at, uh, we haven't done a bike lane investment yet, but we just invested in skip scooters. And then we're not necessarily restricting ourselves to just the roads. Uh, we're all, we all are also doing investments in ocean-going autonomy and uh, air mobility. We have an investment in Joby, which is a, a vertical takeoff and landing air taxi. So that's the portfolio, at least what we've announced. I think if you do the count, you'll be, it'll be less than 27, but we haven't announced everything yet. Uh, so the next question is, OK, well, that's all great, Jim. How do you make these decisions? And so I want to circle back to this financial criteria and strategic criteria. In the financial cr criteria uh, arena, uh, we look at three things. We look at the company, we look at the market, we look at the deal. So, and this is to scale. Uh, uh, we look at the company, and we look at the team, the product and the technology, uh, and the business model, the things that the company can control. The most important thing for us is team. And we look, f and why is that? Because it's hype cycle, right? They're going to have to pivot. They're going to get punched in the mouth by the market. They're going to have to change. So you want, in the, a team, you want both humility and confidence. You don't want so much humility that it's ins insecurity, but you don't want so much confidence that it's arrogance. Right? So you want this balance of a team that has the, co the courage of their convictions, but the humility to listen to the market when uh, the market punches them in the, th in the mouth. So that's really important to us. Uh, of course, the product and technology is important, and the business model innovation is actually equally important. Most of the times, the business model, and I know a bunch of folks in the room are thinking about business models, those are uh, the competitive advantage that most successful companies really bring. If you look at most successful companies over the last decade, it's the business model that's been innovative. And then the market, is it big enough uh, uh, is it ready enough? Is it broken? Uh, is it willing to be fixed? In, in my example, uh, with election equipment and online voting, the market wasn't ready. Automotive wasn't ready until a few years ago. For, for decades, automotive wasn't really ready. Now it's ready. So can the market be accessed by the company? And then finally, and this is about 50, 35, uh, 15 uh, proportions, the, the, the deal itself, uh, uh, is it priced right, right? We don't want to price at the top of the hype cycle. If you price below it, we could wait it out. Uh, we just want to sell, uh, have the company sold at a higher price than we paid. And then what are, what's the financing risk? Are there other folks in the deal uh, that could help finance the company as it goes? We don't want to be the only wallet at the table. And then on the strategic side, three criteria also to scale. The first one, the biggest one, is new business. Uh, Toyota isn't uh, a big risk taker. I don't think that's a secret. Uh, and so venture capital is good for looking out over the horizon into new businesses. So we look at, could Toyota ever be in this business? We ask that question a lot. We, we usually don't ask the company those questions because they'll always say no. Uh, but we kind of envision, like even Joby, when we first uh, discussed it, we've been investors more than two years, the answer was, and this was when we were first, we were asking uh, probably 
too often, whether it was a good fit or not. They said, no, no, we'll never do that. And it turns out that uh, if there's going to be a flying car, Toyota will be making it. Boeing will not be making it. Aviation companies will not be making this. Why? The volume. On a good year, the aviation companies make 2,000 vehicles in a year. Toyota makes 10 million vehicles in a year. A flying car will be made by an automotive maker. So we look at new businesses. Second, we look at uh, planned businesses, things that might be in the hopper for the next five, five, two to five to 10 years. And then finally, we look at and we weight this the least is existing business. Venture capital is not really there to help existing business. And I'm not saying it can't. I'm just saying that if you really want to look out over the horizon and at the same time help existing businesses, those objectives are across purposes. So there's other ways to help existing businesses, like strategic procurement or partnerships. And, and that's often the way to help existing business. Venture capital, as, as fun as it may be, does not solve all the problems. Uh, even though a lot of folks love to invest money, uh, you got to be really thoughtful about where in the business it can help. And it really is pretty far off strategic goals. So that's what we're up to. Uh, you can learn more about us uh, online. Uh, we write a blog. Uh, you can check that out if you want to join one of our startups. Uh, we have a talent network. We're on the Twitters. We're on the LinkedIn's. Uh, thanks for hanging out late. Just a quick one. So sure. um, those cycles that you um, very eloquently displayed there around hype, et cetera, have you, and you also uh, spoke about Dalio, who is an interesting character. Is, have you analyzed a relationship between uh, uh, money supply and, and um, sort of monetary policy as it relates to those same cycles? Oh, yeah. Uh, so macroeconomics matter a lot, uh, clearly. Uh, if you look at all the venture capital funds, they're, they're typically funded with pension funds and, and that have uh, many competitive sources uh, to invest. So part of uh, when money is, is plentiful, as uh, Mr. Ballinger likes to say, the world is a washing capital. Uh, they tend to, it tends to find its way into venture capital funds, uh, but when money starts to tighten up and interest rates start to rise and there's other places to place money, there's a pullback on venture capital. And so we would like a little bit of a pullback because uh, that would help prices. So it's just not necessarily the maturity of the technology, but it, uh, it, the macroeconomic environment uh, affects it quite a bit, actually. It, it's, not, it, it's a little delayed in time. If we have a big crash, a, uh, pension funds could stop uh, honoring their capital calls. That would be bad. But, um, uh, but if it's not catastrophic kind of crash, then it, it, it's delayed out, which is nice because it gives us some time uh, to, to, to compensate. All right. Great.